Okay, I'm ready to begin. So, Lord bless you. What's that? Okay, Ephesians chapter 1. And I gave uh, your uh, outline is over there. Okay. Ephesians chapter 1. We're looking at uh, and we're surveying the, if we call Romans the magnum opus of uh, Paul, his greatest work, then Ephesians is a close second. Ephesians is a church epistle. And Paul is going to reveal God's mystery of the church to him. And so we see the first three chapters very easily divide to divide uh, Ephesians. The first three chapters are doctrinal. It's, um, it concerns the church and uh, the uh, last four chapter, or last three chapters, four through eight, deal with the conduct of the church. And so uh, it's very easy to divide this, this uh, book up. Now, Ephesus was written, as, as we said, a prison epistle. We know there's uh, Ephesus, the Philippians, and Colossians, and Philemon were all written from Rome after Paul had gone, as we saw in the book of Acts, um, to Rome. And now he's writing back to these churches. Now, he spent... Uh, Three years in Ephesus, uh, both Ephesus and Colossae was were the, or Ephesus and Corinthians were the two cities that he spent the most time in, and we see that uh, the strongest church of them all probably was the church at Ephesus. Now, uh, many people believe, as you would read Ephesus, uh, that because it was or Ephesians, uh, since it was um, the core church, the seven churches that were. Uh, mentioned in the book of Revelation or written to in the book of Revelation. Actually, many of those churches, if not all of them, were offsprings of the church of Ephesus. It was a very strong church. Uh, it was as far as, uh, if, if Romans was his greatest work as far as literally or literature, uh, or in literature, then Ephesus was probably his greatest work as a church. But uh, it had a great deal of influence and Many people believe when he says e Ephesians that uh, it is, <clears throat> he's writing and there's evidence that he's not writing just to those Ephesians, but to, uh, there were many people in the church of Ephesus that now we're starting churches in other areas like Laodicea and, uh, and Colossae and so forth. In fact, we'll see that uh, when he writes to Colossae uh, that he's actually writing to three churches He's writing to Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea, which were all in the same valley. And we'll see that he mentions that uh, intrinsically in the, in the letter that he writes. And so we see in the book of Ephesus that Paul is, uh, is uh, writing this from the prison cell about A.D. 61. Now, there's, it's always critical to remember A.D. 70. A.D. 70 was when the temple was destroyed by the Romans. And so you can tell a big difference uh, between the writings after uh, the book of, or after AD 70, <coughs> than you can, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the ones before, because the temple is mentioned or whatever, uh, especially the book of Hebrews. Hebrew, the book of Hebrews goes into detail about the blood of bulls and goats and so forth. And so it was written before the uh, AD 70, before the destruction of the temple. But uh, Ephesus now is uh, um, one of these main areas there in Asia Minor. And we see that uh, actually the theme is set forth in the very first verses. Notice he says, Paul, uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace be from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us from in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And so we see that uh, he's setting forth now the program. 
that uh, both the institution and the program, as far as living uh, before the Lord, um, as he's chosen us before the foundation of the world, that we should live without blame or that we should live with a purpose in this world. And of course, it's in love, in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that will be my, the theme of our message this morning in First John is love. And um, we're going to be talking quite a bit about that. John mentions love in that, those five chapters almost 50 times. And so, uh, and by this, the world may know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And there's, there's, one, there's two areas of uh, Christianity that when you call yourself a Christian, that the world automatically looks at. They look at how you treat others, love, and honesty, truth, love and truth. And so we see that uh, are, you, are you true to what you say that you believe? And uh, so we see that uh, now he says that he's setting this forth. And then Ephesus, as he's writing to them, then you can divide the first three chapters up then into, first of all, uh, verses 3 through 14. He is praising them for their spiritual possession. And he goes on, notice in verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now, just a little side note here. In Colossians chapter 1, he says almost the same thing, but he leaves out one word or a couple of words. He says, in him we have redemption, um, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And many people who, um, who uh, now the King James includes uh, the, uh, the, uh, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Um, and it's left out in Colossians. And yet, as you go back and look at the transcripts, you'll see that it was put off to the side by the translators and back to Ephesians 1.7. Now, it's definitely there in Ephesians 1.7. And so if anybody takes it out through his blood, if they take it out of that passage, we know that it's going to be a liberal translation. They're trying to take the blood out of the Bible. But over in Colossians, there's many manuscripts that doesn't have it. And so simply because it's not there doesn't mean, I mean, some translations do put it in, some don't. Uh, simply because it isn't there doesn't mean that it's a bad translation. But if it's left out of, first, of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, then it's definitely there. So does that make sense? As a result of that, there's a lot of people that want to hang on to the King James and say that, oh, see, they're taking the blood out. No, uh, that's one of those things where you can trace it back and see where they, some translators or some manuscripts put it in. And, we, and uh, there again is uh, those little notes that they'll put off to the side. And by the way, the King James Version, uh, the original 1611, had all kinds of notes off to the side, you know, on, on both sides. And so uh, that, that's nothing new. But um, there are those who want to say that the King James is the only Bible that we use. Uh, bless our hearts. As long as I'll practice it, you know, uh, then I don't have any problem with it. Um, but, uh, that, in, but that is a key verse, in whom we have redemption. And we've talked about that word redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And he's going to talk about that great spiritual possession that we have in him. And so he goes on and we see that, uh, it, that um, he, so he says, uh, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Now he's going to get into what that mystery of his will is as far as the church is concerned in chapters two and three the mystery uh, of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both in heaven and which are on earth in him. And so we see then that uh, God has a plan and that here's that word dispensation. God has a certain dispensation that we're in today. 
uh, we are different than the church, than the, excuse me, than the uh, uh, Old Testament Israel. We have a whole different institution. The blood of bulls and goats is now no longer applicable to us. Many of the ceremonial laws are not applicable to us. And so uh, God has set up what the institution called the church. And we see that in the book of Acts. And we really stress that. We start off in the temple in Jerusalem and we end up in the church in Rome. Not the church of Rome as we talk about today, but we see how that Paul at the very end of Acts says, okay, I'm tired of going and uh, being rejected by the, by the uh, Jews. I'm going to the Gentiles. And that's where the book of Acts ends. And so we're in the age of the Gentiles. We're in the age of the church. And we know that, uh, and Paul tells us, as we've already seen, one of the first doctrines he brings out to the Thessalonians is that, that the church age is going to end one day. And it's going to end when? At the rapture, when the Lord takes his church up to be with him. And so if you, a dispensation, the word literally means order of the household. In other words, God changes his household around as he wants. Uh, Lord, God knows in my, in my house, my wife, whenever she says, Dan, in a certain way, I know, oh no, oh no. She's wanting to change the household. She's wanting to move the furniture. So, you know, I know she's wanting to change things around. And I've moved that big old cedar chest around at least 50 times in the last 10 years. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, oh, I want it under the window. I want, no, but she wants her order changed a, a little bit. And so, uh, uh, so she changes the order of her household. Well, God ch changes the atmosphere. God uh, moved out the ark. We don't have it anymore. And now he's instituted the church in the Lord's table. Now, of course, we don't, that, that doesn't even have the same significance that the ark had, but I think you understand what I'm saying. It's the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness. And uh, so we see that uh, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and that word fullness, in the fullness of times, God sent forth his son. So God is working, and at the exact time, he knows exactly what he's going to do. And we see that leading up now in the fullness of times. God is getting ready to do something. The Antichrist is out there. Uh, we're in a world of confusion and hurt right now. And the one thing that keeps the, anti uh, the, the forces of evil from really being turned loose on us is that uh, all these different groups don't have a strong leader yet. But he's coming. He's going to pull all this evil together. And we know that he's going to be persecuting Israel. And we already see all that <clears throat> taking place now. We see the kings of the east are starting to form. We see Iran, Persia, uh, really taking on a, a whole new uh, significance. We see Russia uh, as she's going to be coming down from the north and all those things that are going to happen during the tribulation after the church is taken out. So we see that all that's preparing, but yet still we don't know whether it's going to be tomorrow or 50 years from now. And yet uh, we see that uh, God is working in this dispensation and that uh, this is the church age, which Paul's going to uh, recognize and he's going to show in the first three chapters of Ephesians. And then in, in verse 13 uh, through 23, we see the spiritual perception. He says, in him, of course, in him, who? Jesus Christ. Um, you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In verse 15, we have a change of gears. Therefore, and whenever you see a therefore or a wherefore, you look to see what it is there for. So therefore, as a result of what we've just talked about, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all the saints do not cease to give thanks for, for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the, and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, 
according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him on the right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality and power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So notice in Christ we have that we see the riches of his calling, the inheritance that we have in the saints. That we see, and what we want to see as a church is the exceeding greatness of his power that, of course, he displayed in the, in the resurrection. But we want to see it as the life that he gives to lost people and turns them from death to life and from the uh, darkness to light and that uh, they may receive what we have. That's what Paul said, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. And so that was his whole ministry. And so, uh, Lord, give us light. But then, Lord, uh, take that, let us take that light and may we see it manifest. There's that word that we'll be talking about again in First John. But uh, manifest, made obvious. May, may we see it. May your, we see your power made obvious not only in our lives and what you do, but Lord, in others, as they are transformed before our very eyes into people that are enemies of God to now people who love God. And we prayed for people this morning uh, before we began uh, because we want to see them turn from that darkness to light. We want to see them saved. That great miracle where it looks impossible and yet God through the exceeding greatness of his power, does his work. So we see in chapters 1, then, that he talks about the praise of, of the saints, and, the, that, and then the prayer is that they would have a spiritual perception of the great gifts and the power that God has given us. But then in chapter 2, he goes in as a prelude to uh, the church. He talks about what God has given us as in our new condition. And you, he made a life. So God, you know, raised us from the dead. God has saved our souls. And so we see that in you, he made a life who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, uh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So there again, we were once, and their key word there, we were once like that. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but he made us alive. He gave us life. And of course, why? Because we were born again. And so as a result, we have this great spiritual state that we have now, uh, this condition that we're in. And so, and of course, in this passage, he talks about but God who was rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. And of course, uh, the only reason we can love him is because he loved us. And then we were dead in trespasses and sins. He made us alive. So it's, notice he's going back through what God has done for us. And then, of course, the great verse that we like to remember, and it's one of the great verses, one of the basic verses you need to know, and that is uh, verses, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, um, where he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So he's going through this, and he is, uh, he's reminding us, that he's praising us in chapter 1 for what we have. He tells us how we got it in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, the great condition where we were turned from darkness to light, and how that our ministry is to want to see others turn from darkness to light and from enemies of God to lovers of God. And so we see that. And then, of course, we, the, he follows that up, lest any man should boast, for as a result of that, in verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God pre prepared for beforehand that we should walk in them. So it is God's will. We are his workmanship. God is working in our lives. And as a result, uh, we are created for good works. 
And God has a plan for us. He says that he's prepared for us to walk in them. So we are saved, but we're not saved to sit around. We're saved for God to do something with us. God has a mission for you. We see that throughout Paul's writings. So, uh, Philippians 1, 6, is he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We saw in 1 John again, uh, where he says, God is destroying the works of the devil. He's doing that in our lives as he comes in. He keeps cleansing us. He keeps sanctifying us and setting us apart and, uh, and showing us progressive growth in him and mature, spiritual maturity, being able to discern between good and evil and the power to do good and having victory over sin and death. And so we see this is, a, this is uh, nothing, the, the whole New Testament is woven in the fact of the blood of Jesus Christ forgives, uh, takes away our sins, but then what we're to do as a result of being saved and the mission that we have and what we want to see is that manifest work of God, not only in our lives that others see, but in their lives that we see. We want to see God work. Uh, it was very good to see a person that, uh, that you invited. Last, how, many to, how many years have you invited that guy to church? Then he just pops in. Well, what a blessing. Nobody taught, she didn't call him. In fact, she was very surprised that he came. But uh, that's what we're praying for. I'm praying for right now, three different people. Right now, I prayed for him this morning. Lord, I'd love to see him pop in like this man did. And we've been praying for him for years now. And one day they're going to wake up and they're going to say, you know, uh, I need to, to go to, to Calvary. I need to go to Calvary Baptist Church. I, like I said, back uh, years ago, my father, when I was a little boy, um, he got up one Easter morning, he said, and just woke us all up and said, we're going to church. If I don't, Charlie's going to bug me to pieces. He, he, he used more flowery language that my wife doesn't want me even to put the, the letter in front, but to whatever. But uh, um, so we went to church and that changed my life. It didn't change all my family's life, but it did mine. It's just amazing what God did with my father. And so I'm praying for other fathers around here or mothers, it's the same thing. And what God does in people's lives. And so uh, he's the one who does the work. And of course, we are the ones who are to do the sowing. We're the ones who are to, we're the mouthpiece. And it's not going to be our might or our power or our wisdom or our great debating skills that's going to get these people saved. It's going to be our steady loving them and letting them know we're concerned about them and we sure would like to see them know the Lord is their Savior. And so uh, the more that we can do that, it's the Lord who all of a sudden the light turns on in their life. And that's what I'm praying for now. I, I still, the Lord surprised me this morning. I want to see somebody I've been praying for that uh, just keeps telling me no. I want to see them in church. You know, or an open door where I can witness to them. You know, where they're ready and they're asking questions. Well, that's the, those are the great ones. And so we see again that uh, spiritual condition that God has given, has given us not only to know him, but also we are created for his good works. And then as a result of that in, chapter, in verses 11 um, through the rest of the chapter, he deals with that new relationship. Uh, Therefore, remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh who are called in circumcision by which, uh, by what is also called the circumcision. So he's saying you were called uncircumcision by the Jews, uh, made the flesh of hands. But he says, but now you have a spiritual circumcision. You have been saved. And these people that have been physically circumcised really are the spiritually uncircumcised. And so he starts drawing uh, differences between Jews who reject the Lord and Gentiles who do accept the Lord. Uh, then in verse 14, for he himself is our peace, um, who hath made us both one, Jew and Gentile, having broke down the, broken down the middle wall of separation, um, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments uh, containing in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, both Jew and Gentile. 
Now, what did the Lord do uh, at his death? Remember, he died and a lot of different things happened. But remember the, that big, huge, uh, several ton weight uh, veil in the temple tore in two. And it didn't tear from the bottom up. It tore from the top down. So it tells you the power. If you've ever seen uh, theater curtains, they are thick. You just don't go in and tear them up. And they're dangerous. They, they got chains on the bottom of them to keep them down. And people have been killed by those things. In fact, uh, you'll hear stories. And I know that um, I had a couple of people that I knew that to the school I went to, they were big into the theater. And there are a couple of people that got killed because a rope broke and that thing came down. Uh, but those curtains were nothing compared to that veil in the temple, which was a tapestry and just a very thick. It was made to be thick so that it wouldn't fly back and forth and it was definitely going to be opaque because behind that was the Holy of Holies. Well, the Lord tore that down because now we can go before the throne of grace, the Holy of Holies. You know, let us come boldly before the throne of grace in chapter of Hebrews. He, the writer of Hebrews explains that. We don't need to go through a high priest anymore or a, a earthly priest. We have a high priest and that's the Lord Jesus. And so Paul is saying to the Ephesians, now both of you are equal. Don't let the Jews get you into, you know, back in the temple, but don't be, but realize there's Jews that need to be, that are saved too. So we, we go both ways. Um, you know, uh, we want to take on a new missionary soon. And we got two or three options as far as uh, Jewish missionaries. How many of those have we had come through recently? And people that are wanting to minister to the Jews. Well, um, we need to pray about that. What does God want us to do? Uh, because we want both Jew and Gentile. We've had Jews visit here. And I'd like to see, I mean, I'd, I want, yeah, I, I want to create a church. I mean, I want to, I'd love for God to create a church where we can be the example of what multiracial, multicultural, multi can be. We're just, people just love to be around one another. And they, they're excited about the differences rather than looking at the differences. In fact, the thing I have to be careful about is that uh, I'm always wanting to find out something different about someone who lives in someplace else. When I wrote uh, to the friend, man, man from England, I let him know, hey, listen, I just talked to a British Marine and uh, we had a jolly good talk. And I said, I'd, yeah, I'd love to get with you. And just yeah, because I love talking to to different people, even though oh, England, that's not much different. Oh, it's a huge difference between us, them and us. Um, uh, we don't have bonnets here. We have bonnets, but we don't call them bonnets. You know what a bonnet is? Your Easter bonnet. That was, what was the, what was it? Just one of those little things that you put your hands in. Was that what a bonnet was? No. What is a bonnet? It's the hood of the car. No, no, I know that, but I'm talking about for Americans. What's a, put on your Easter bonnet. Remember that little song, the Easter parade? Oh, well, oh, it's a cap. Okay. Well, in England, it's the hood of a car. So, you know, and they don't call them elevators. They call them lifts and all that. Even Canada is fun. My wife and I would drive over to Canada when we lived about 30 miles from there, uh, across the big bridge there in, uh, from uh, Port Huron into Sarnia. And when we got into to Canada, it was, uh, they didn't say merge left, they said squeeze left. And my wife would come over and squeeze me, you know, whatever, but, to, but we, had, you know, we had fun with that kind of stuff, you know. So the, the, I love that kind of stuff. Why, why should we, we should celebrate our differences. And the thing about it is because of our atmosphere, when I start asking people, you know, but I, like I tell them, I say, don't, I mean, I'm, I'm just asking because I'm curious, but I'm not wanting to put you down. In fact, you know, I want to find out what you got that's going good for you, you know, and stuff like that. So, but then again, you know, you don't want to overdo anything. And sometimes I probably do, but that's, you know, but that's exciting. I love missionaries to come in. And one of the first things that kids start talking to missionaries about is, uh, is those differences. Like uh, in China, there was a, we had a missionary that kind of talked about, they do this and like, come over to my house and, uh, and something like eat with me. And that's their way of saying hello. 
but they are not expecting you to come over to their house and eat with them. You know, it's kind of like uh, down south. Y'all come back, you hear, can't stand your guts. But you come back, you hear, you know. Uh, there's no, not like, okay, I'm sorry. But uh, no, there's a lot of good southerners, like southern hospitality. But they could also be very phony, you know. Um, so uh, there again, it's, you want it to, whatever you do say, whatever culture you're in, you want it to be genuine. And so, um, so those are the things that we love about it. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, and of course, uh, Corinth was probably the most multicultural church that he wrote to. And boy, did they have their problems. And so we see that uh, we want to be that type of example. Now, and uh, so we see that um, in chapter 11, that our relationship with Christ and then uh, what the condition is, our relationship with one another as a result of, of our relationship with Christ uh, and then we see that he tells us uh, in verse 14, he says, for he himself is our peace. What's, uh, if we're spiritual, what do we have? Love, which produces joy, which produces peace. And so, again, he says, he is our peace, who has made us one, has broken down that middle wall of separation between Jew and Gentile, and as a result, now we have, we are one in Christ, one body. Um, and notice in verse 17, and he, became, he came and preached peace to you who were far off. What do we preach to people? Peace. We want them to have the peace with God and we want them to have the peace of God in their lives. Uh, verse 19, therefore, now, therefore you are uh, no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. Earlier he says, you've been accepted into the beloved. We skipped over, but uh, we've been accepted. And so what that great blessing that we have in knowing Christ. In chapter 3 now, we get into that area of the church, the mystery of the church. Uh, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, if indeed you have heard of that dispensation, there it is again, the order of the household, of the grace of God, which is given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which uh, you read, uh, you may, and that you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, a mystery in the Bible is something that God has not revealed yet. But Paul says, I'm revealing to you this mystery. So a mystery becomes a revelation. So now he's revealing the church. He says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. They didn't know anything about the church in the Old Testament. But uh, he talks about the Gentiles now. But now in verse 8, he says, To me, who am less than the least of the apostles, this grace was given, that I may preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in Christ, who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. I love that verse. God is saying that the manifold wisdom, in other words, the the, uh, multifaceted wisdom of God is now being taught even to the angels by what he is doing in what? That new institution called the church, by the church to the principalities. That's the powers that be, the, the powers in heaven. So God is teaching through Calvary Baptist Church this morning, good old, uh, Lu- uh, not Lucifer, <laughs> Lucifer, but uh, good old, uh, boy, let's forget him, but uh, Michael and whoever else is up there. He's teaching them, hey, come over. Let me show you what I can do with that motley crew down there at Calvary Baptist Church. I better watch that term. I think that was a rock group. But, uh, you know, there again is um, you know, what, what I can do with those, those, those people. And so we see that he says, according, in verse, um, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose, God has a purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord, 
In whom we have boldness and access. There's that word. I love that word. We have access with confidence through faith in him. We have access to heaven. I've been accepted into the beloved. I have access to the throne of grace. We saw that back in Romans chapter 5. We have access. We have standing with God. We don't need a priest because I am a priest. I'm a, a, royal, priest, a royal priesthood. Why, how, why, how, does, how do I function as a preacher? When I, a priest, when I go before the throne of grace and pray for others and intercede for them, that makes us a priest, doesn't it? So uh, in that sense, a, a, can women be a priest? Yes. I uh, like what uh, Luther said, a woman praying at her, I don't think he used the word sink, but being a German and back in the Middle Ages, but he said praying in her kitchen is just as holy as the priest at the altar. You didn't see that back then. I mean, because in my, how many times have we talked about a mother's prayer, the power of, of women? And so, yes, we all in one can come before the Lord and pray to him because we all have access to him. Now, we do know there's different offices and different requirements for them. But as far as functions, we could all be priests. And so we see that, therefore, I ask you not to lose heart of my tribulations, which I have for you, because, hey, folks, what I have, I want you to have. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Lord, uh, before the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I want you to know the, that the whole family of earth and heaven is named. I want you to know. And he says in verse 20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. So God wants us to have that, the glory in the church, just like they had it in first uh, century, by Jesus Christ in this generation and forever. Oh, that the Lord would allow us to pass on to a new generation, the things of God. And so again, this is the scope of the church. Now that's the doctrinal, of course, we spent most of our time there. In chapter four through six, we have the practical, or we have the conduct of the Christian. And we see that uh, he talks about now, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, beseech you, I beg you to walk worthy of this great calling that you have. You're a member of the church of God. Walk worthy of that. Be proud of it. Godly pride. But then there are certain things you need to do to distinguish yourself from the world. And he's going to get into uh, the church uh, acting corporately before the Lord. And um, that he gave some apostles and some prophets, verse 11, uh, and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping, and this is what we have, they, these are the officers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of, our, of the Son of God, to the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of, men, trick, trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plottings, but speaking the truth in love. There it is, truth in love. People want to see us uh, in our um, virtue as well as our love. May grow up in all things in him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together. So here he's saying the, the product of the church then is that the pastor and any officer, anybody that is a, a spiritual head, a, a leader in the church, both men and women, we are all there to edify the body, to teach the body right from what the Bible says. And as a result, that um, we edify one another, we are self-contained. In other words, what you see is us. But uh, we're self-contained as humanly, but we are totally dependent on our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So in that sense, we're not contained at all. Uh, we're totally dependent on him. And so the, he'll set forth, and of course he goes into marriage and the Holy Spirit, and of course that great uh, uh, passage in chapter 6 that all the boys, and my boys, I ran across something the other day where they still had that spiritual armor with the helmet and, and the stuff that uh, we, I think we got them for Christmas one day, one time, about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and all that in chapter 6. But the, the rest of the chapter deals with the church and the conduct of the church. And so we see that uh, we're to equip the church. The church is to function together. The family is to learn how to love one another. And uh, of course, there's whole studies in that. And um, then uh, as, as far as learning how to uh, fight Satan, he's our, we got to learn how to fight the wiles of Satan. And that's chapter six. So we see all that in uh, the book of Ephesians. It's a tremendous book. We spent what, a better part of a year on Ephesians, uh, just going through it. And what a blessing it was to me. All, every passage is just filled full of wisdom uh, and also challenge. Lord, am I meeting your goals? Am I fulfilling what you've called me to do in, uh, in my personal life, in my public life, in my pastor professional work life. I don't consider myself a professional, but you understand what I'm saying. Am I doing what God's, am I fulfilling what the role you call me as a father, as a husband, as a church member? And as a woman, of course, my, of course, I want to see my wife blossom and to be able to do great things for the Lord. So am I, am I providing her an atmosphere where she can expand? Am I helping my people to learn what it is to really find the fullness of God. And so that's all part of it. And God's good, isn't he? That's the program here, is that we want to be a church that honors God and that uh, we learn how to walk with him. Boy, time flew by. But I hope that will give you an appetite for the book of Ephesians and really dig into it. Father, thank you for your word. We pray you will bless it to our hearts now. We need to see, Lord, one thing we want to see, we pray for it, we hunger for it. And that is, Lord, that, that manifest power of God, that power to be manifested in the lives of others, that we see it, that you change their lives, that the gospel is strong, and what you can do in our lives through answered prayer. Bless, Lord, your people now in Jesus' name. Amen.